Um, but I have the pleasure now to introduce Dr. Jordy <coughs> Thompson, and who practices integrative family medicine. And um, I think I would like him to explain what that is, because a lot of people don't know. And I also would like him to tell us about himself. But I'm thrilled, because he's going to talk about Lyme and pandas. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to just thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me. And for uh, thanks to Paul Hardy for suggesting me. Um, <clears throat> it's a real honor to be here. Um, it's interesting, I was telling Peggy that um, as, as I am speaking here in uh, Manchester, there's a big um, conference of the International Lyme Group, which is in Washington, D.C., and Dr. Suedo is currently speaking about pans and pandas with the, uh, with the Lyme Group. So it's sort of a, something that that's is... That's new, that's real new. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is... She was, anybody was in Providence knows she kind of rolled her eyes when we would talk about Lyme. <laughs> Much to the disappointment of many of you in that crowd. So that is huge. So I think there's, you know, the research, the Cunningham panel, uh, these things are beginning to come together. And my talk today, I'm going to try and <clears throat> whiz through a lot of the slides. M many of you know these statistics and details, and so I won't you know, spend a lot of time on them, but um, if there are, if you need further clarification, we can do so, I think, in the question and answer period. Um, a little bit about me, I'm a family physician. I came to New Hampshire in 1993 to start something called the Community Health Center, which was just starting in Manchester. And <clears throat> subsequently, I've opened about six other practices. Um, currently, I'm in my own little practice in Peterborough, just a block away from where Paul Hardy practices currently. Um, and I do general family medicine and a fair amount of Lyme disease treatment um, and see kids with pans and pandas, you know, on a daily basis. Um, and it's very exciting. <clears throat> I, um, I love what I do. Um, I hate insurance companies. Uh, <laughs> But <clears throat> I'm very grateful to the many people who've come as patients and have become friends for supporting what I do. And uh, I think if we all hang together, we'll get through this struggle um, over the next few years. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and start the talk. And if you can't hear me, let me know. All right, so uh, that's a little disclaimer. <laughs> Help me, Peggy. There we go. You're just hit it kind of hard. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, Lyme disease in the U.S. was initially talked about in about 1975, where there was this cohort of kids who seemed to have juvenile uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, a lot of work was done, and over the next uh, five years, the um, etiology of this quote unquote juvenile rheumatoid arthritis was discovered. So um, Alan Steer and his colleagues published in the uh, Journal of Arthritis and Rheumatism. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> it's sort of interesting to me that um, Alan Steer is still practicing. I, one of the controversies in, in Lyme disease is this sort of battle that goes on between the International Lyme's group and the American uh, Infectious Disease group. Um, and uh, Alan was actually was a, was, is a rheumatologist, and I think some of the infectious disease <coughs> people feel that had this disease been sort of handed off by the uh, NIH to it, the infectious disease protagonists versus the rheumatoid protagonists, there might be differences now in, in what's happened, but that's a, a, another discussion. So um, <clears throat> there is a lot of um, previous history with Lyme disease that, you know, maybe it's been around for a long time. And in fact, there was a, a uh, frozen specimen discovered in the Alps of, a, of a, um, some kind of a warrior, probably from the 14th century, who was found to have uh, spirochetes in his tissues, and the thought was maybe he had Lyme disease. So it's, it's been around a long time. I think there's been some speculation that in World War II, 
spirochetes, the Borrelia spirochetes, were somehow changed and may have been used as a biological weapon. And some of these spirochetes were brought to Plum Island in, uh, off the coast of Massachusetts, and deer that had swum out to Plum Island at low tide had been infected. I'm not sure how much um, of that is true or not. We may never find out. It's sort of one of those uh, hidden mysteries. But it's interesting to speculate that the big center of Lyme disease is in New England um, and the east coast of the United States. Okay. How are you doing? Is it going in? Oh, I'll just do that. This is a <coughs> picture of um, Willy Bergdorfer. He was the gentleman who actually discovered uh, the uh, tick gut protagonist, Borrelia burgdorferi, named after him. And um, uh, he was looking for some other form of, uh, of disease in the tick, but, but discovered this and um, discovered two very important parts of the tick called OSPA and OSPC. And those are um, antigens that are on the outside of the bacteria. And they're very important because they're used as part of the diagnostic strategy. And I think one of the problems with the whole diagnosis and controversy with Lyme disease is the way we diagnose it. The um, spirochetes are very difficult to culture. Um, even though people are culturing them, there are many, many spirochetes in the world, and sometimes you need to use special reagents to identify which is the Bergdorferi and which is something else. So um, the ticks can actually change their, I mean, the, the bacteria, the Lyme bacteria can change its coat based on whether it's in an animal, a human, in a test tube, and, on, and with different media. So you have a lot of controversy about how to diagnose. It's kind of interesting. Um, and I think that's also led to some of the problems that we have diagnosing uh, Lyme disease currently. So there are <coughs> many other species. Um, in Europe um, and Asia, there are all three species. In the US, it's primarily been Bor Borrelia burgdorferi. However, we're now seeing some of the European species. There are also some new species. Um, there's a new Borrelia that uh, is being found in the south, and it's associated with red meat allergies. And I think it's going to be, it's part of the Lone Star tick, um, which is a much tougher tick, and it seems to be taking over some of the uh, areas that the deer tick has, has resided in previously. So, we may be seeing more red meat allergies. I don't know. Uh, I think they're beginning to see it on Cape Cod. I haven't seen any in New Hampshire yet. So I'm going to just run for a few of these little slides. Um, this is what the Borrelia burgdorferi looks like. It's kind of a corkscrew. And the um, interesting thing is that on the outside of this um, uh, bacteria are these um, very uh, powerful muscles, and those are called the flagella. So the whole thing is like a big, uh, um, a big wand, really, and it can move very rapidly through connective tissue as well as uh, through the blood. Here's another picture. Um, <coughs> It's very hard to get organisms. They don't really live in the blood very long. They like to be in tissues. So that means you have to get tissue samples to do a lot of the diagnosis. And that's very difficult to do uh, because people don't like their parts cut out of them for unknown reasons. <laughs> These are the um, uh, flagelli that I was talking about. They wrap around. and. Um, the interesting thing about the Lyme bacteria is that the Lyme bacteria has different um, forms. So there are spherocytes, which are little blobs. There are these flagelli that I just showed you. And it also, the uh, bacteria also exists in colonies called cysts. 
case you've never seen a deer tick, this is what the deer tick looks like. Um, they have kind of a red body. They're not very big. That's an adult female. They're the ones that do the infecting. Here is the life cycle, which is kind of interesting and important. Uh, in the spring, we see mostly nymphs. They've hatched out from the eggs, and they can infect a whole source of animals. The nymphs are really, really small. And um, so some people call um, tick-borne disease from the nymph an invisible disease. You really, I mean, these are the size of a, of, a, of a poppy seed and smaller. So they're very hard to recognize. And they don't take long to transmit Lyme disease. In some studies, they've noted transmission in two hours. I think the current thinking is, oh, they've got to be on you for 24 to 36 hours, but actually the studies are different. They show that in, within two hours these can transmit. What happens is the bacteria reside in the foregut of the tick, and when the tick starts to bite, it injects its foregut chemicals to create a path of uh, um, anticoagulation so that it can suck more blood out. And it's in that anticoagulant that you find some bacteria. So. I think the 24 to 36 hour uh, theory may be general, true, but there's also evidence that it, the tick can transmit disease in two hours. Over the course of the summer, the tick uh, feed on mammals and they get to be bigger. And then in the fall, you see a lot more adults. The summer, uh, a lot of people say, oh, we don't see many ticks in the summer. Um, they're out there, they're just not on humans as much, and probably not as many are on dogs. They're more down in the lower part of the ground where the rodents travel. So you see a lot on rodents if you were to catch them. The other big source of, uh, of um, transmission are birds. Birds migrate, and birds have ticks on them, and this was discovered in Canada. The Canadian government swore up and down that there was no Lyme disease in Canada. So one day a gentleman who was uh, suffering from Lyme disease had the job of collecting the little birds that flew into the big glass buildings in Toronto. That was his job and he would take them and he began to look at them and notice that they were covered in ticks. Well, there was no lab that he could send those ticks to in Canada so he sent them to the hygienics lab in California. Sure enough, they were loaded with Lyme disease. So I think that myth about no Lyme disease in Canada has been dispelled. So that's, there's more information on tick life cycle. There's the size, sort of a, that's a dime, and you can see the engorged tick here and the unengorged black-legged or deer tick on the left. It's pretty small. All right, so one of the things that ticks do is something called erythema chronica migrans. Um, this is not the classic bullseye rash, but, but this is the rash that we probably see more frequently from acute tick bites than the bullseye. The bullseye is probably 25% of cases, but I see funny rashes like this all the time. Kids will get them on their faces, on their bodies, behind their knees, and this is uh, produced by the uh, infection. So look out for these um, on yourselves, on your kids, friends, and neighbors. Um, currently, the CDC recommends a two-tiered testing system. Um, there is something called an ELISA. The ELISA is a very broad, general, you know, we cut up a few of the bacteria, we put them in a, a dish, and if, you, if your blood reacts to them, then you have a positive ELISA. They recommend following it up with a, something called a Western blot. And it's the Western blot that has taken those bacteria, has sort of chopped them into little pieces, and they produced antigens against those little pieces. And then they take your blood, and your blood is theoretically full of the antibodies against those little pieces, and they can map out. And based on the number of little antigens or antibodies you have against little pieces is whether or not you have Lyme disease. Um, the problem is that the CDC invented their criteria for surveillance. They were originally looking to find out all the true cases of Lyme disease. And so 
they have, their test has a very high false uh, negative rate. So if you go to the local hospital and get a, a Lyme test done and your, and your ELISA's positive, but then the Western blot comes negative, you probably have a 40 to 50% chance of that being a false negative if they use this particular model. They took out two of the most important, the OSP-A and OSP-C coats that I mentioned earlier. They took those out of their testing schema because back in the 90s, there was a Lyme vaccine that was invented, and they used those two antigens to develop the vaccine. So obviously, they didn't want to get in their surveillance, they didn't want to pick up people who'd been vaccinated for Lyme disease because then they wouldn't have true numbers. Unfortunately, their surveillance criteria have now become diagnostic, and so as a result, we have a very high false negative rate. Um, here is a, an interesting slide. 21% um, of the people with Lyme disease um, report a rash. 79% never get a rash. So we can't really use that as a way of sorting out who has Lyme and who doesn't. I think if you see the rash, they probably have Lyme. If you don't, doesn't mean they, they don't have Lyme. So Paul um, Hardy um, reflected on the insurance dilemmas. There's a lot of insurance dilemmas. The insurance companies require us to use the CDC criteria, and we know they're wrong, but unfortunate they use that to pay bills. So um, this is just a little bit more. So the conclusions, um, there are different um, Bugs that the ticks carry, Paul mentioned Mycoplasma, Bartonella, Lyme, uh, Borrelia. Um, they can cause inflammation, a lot of problems. Uh, they can um, initiate yeast infections from the antibiotics. You can get C. difficile overgrowth, and there are definite nutritional uh, deficiencies that occur with it. This is a nice picture of the tick embedded in some skin. And you can see those are, that's why they're so tough to get out. I don't know if anybody's tried to pull a Lyme tick out, but they're really tough to get out. You know they're, they're there to do business. A um, few slides on the um, controversy surrounding antibiotic treatment. So, um, the infectious disease, uh, American Infectious Disease Group feels that Lyme is a very short-lived entity and that you can actually treat for 30 days, I think 28 days is the official amount, with one antibiotic and that person should be cured of Lyme disease. But in a study done on rhesus monkeys uh, published in 2012, Embers et al. found that they could um, treat these monkeys for 30 days, and that within 90 days they could culture, they could grow live bacteria from these animals. So um, I think that maybe there are hosts, including the human, that will need longer treatment. And I think um, some of that has, has been shown to be true in um, pandas also. So some of the symptoms, you can see it's pretty diffuse. It's the central nervous system, the brain, the peripheral nervous system, so uh, neuropathies and things like that. There's uh, MS-like issues, ALS-like issues. Uh, there's the musculoskeletal or joint problems, some immune dysfunction like fibromyalgia. There are arrhythmias and heart problems that occur, and there's some skin issues. Um, I think a lot of the problems with Lyme disease causes frustration for, for physicians as well as patients. And hopefully, there'll be some information on the way soon that will dispel some of the uh, problems. You can get migratory joint problems. So one day the ankle hurts, the other day it's the right foot, then it's the left shoulder. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories don't seem to be that helpful in treating the pain. And the f 
other issue that has been brought to the fore is the pandas like scenario. And so part of what I see is the bug itself can cause a lot of arthritis and joint pain and, and issues, but there's also a response to the bug, and this is the autoimmune response that's sort of very similar to what you see in pandas. So these are the neuropsychiatric sin symptoms. Um, <clears throat> down at the bottom of the slide, you see Dr. Jones. Charles Ray Jones is probably the preeminent pediatric Lyme specialist. He's treated well over uh, 10,000 children with um, Lyme disease, and he's used long-term antibiotics in most of them. He feels it takes three to seven years for kids to get over this disease. Um, he is also the one that alerted a lot of the um, international Lyme group to Dr. Cunningham's work on pandas. So I think he started using her quote-unquote Cunningham panel much earlier than the rest of us, and uh, it paid, paid off for him. Um, so for treatment, you just have to be aware that there are two standards of care. There's a group from the American Infectious Disease Group that feels it's a short-term 28-day treatment and you're over it. And then there's the international group that feels there's, it's a little bit longer and you may need to have repeated courses of antibiotics, prolonged courses of antibiotics, and as I just mentioned, Dr. Jones has treated kids from three to seven years, the full time on antibiotics to achieve good results. Um, <clears throat> IV therapy can be very, very helpful. Again, it's very difficult to get this past the insurance companies. They just do not want to pay for it. It's relatively expensive. But when you balance it against what we've seen here with the cost for pandas, it becomes less and less expensive. And hopefully their eyes will be opened um, by people advocating for these diseases. Currently, they do approve um, some use of antibiotics. Um, people who are older seem to be, if you failed or oral therapy, if you've had steroids at any time, if you find it in the spinal fluid, and the other big one is if there's a cardiac manifestation. We've also learned that over the time it becomes more than just an infection. It seems to promote a whole, as I've mentioned, immune system problem, this whole issue of neurotoxins. Um, they've done studies where they now find that the coat of the Lyme bacteria can actually cause a neurotoxic effect. And this is uh, very um, interesting. Um, so it sort of goes to the point that, well, you have dead bacteria in your body and, and some people have a hard time getting rid of those coats. And they'll actually get sick just from the dead bacteria. Uh, because a lot of people get waylaid by the fatigue, they, they start to decondition, there's tissue damage in the joints, they don't eat properly, and they get metabolic disturbances. So <clears throat> rest, no caffeine, no alcohol, no smoking, vitamins, exercise program, all of these are critical adjuncts, good nutrition. Prevention is the key. Early treatment is so important. Again, I've mentioned how difficult it is sometimes to treat and uh, to diagnose. Um, so you just have to be aware, I think, that it's in our area. And if you get funny things on your kids, funny rashes, they can, they're limping, and they've been out in the woods or even in the family lawn just to get the mail from the mailbox, they may have Lyme disease. So just people should be aware. <laughs> this, is, this is not so funny, but I, I've had patients of mine who've worn these suits, very similar to this man in armor, and they've actually gotten bitten by ticks. I don't know how they do it. They've covered them with permethrin, and they still seem to get through. So the ticks are pretty hardy. All right, this was, um, this is just the cost of uh, Lyme disease. Um, practically 100% of people who um, have been subsequently diagnosed with Lyme disease had to go to another doctor. Some were diagnosed by their own doctor. 
this is an interesting quote. Um, it's just in, it'll be in your package. So a lot of uh, people have been told that these symptoms are just in their head. And I think, again, that's a common theme with PANDAS patients. You know, this is, you know, you're, you're crazy. This is all in your head. Um, and it brings up the point that these infectious diseases may be, um, we may be beginning to realize that they're responsible for a lot more than just uh, things that are in our heads. Um, this is another little, little anecdote of one of our patients. Um, <clears throat> this is the number of doctors that people with Lyme disease visited. The mean was nine, median six, the mode was five. So there is um, a lot of misunderstanding in the medical community about what constitutes Lyme disease and how to diagnose it. Um, as you can see, most people have joint and muscle, but some people just can't walk, some are bedridden. There's obviously depression. Um, there are extreme symptoms. There are constant symptoms. And there are a lot of neurologic symptoms, very similar to pandas. The um, questionnaire asked people when they thought they were diagnosed. And most people felt they'd been chronically ill for a while before they actually got a diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> Lyme disease in children, there are a lot of um, resources. Um, this is, again, Charles Ray Jones. He has a nice video. I think um, kids are out in the woods. They're low to the ground, and that's where the ticks are. And so they tend to probably get bitten more, more often than adults do. Um, so Lyme disease is not a new disease. Um, Again, even in the States, Dr. Scrementi from Wisconsin published a report on the erythema chronica migrans in the 70s. Um, he tried to relay his information to the STEER group, but they basically ignored him and said, no, we're going to treat with aspirin and steroids. So it's a persisting infection in some individuals. This is the Embers study. Just again, it's in your package. Um, I talked a little bit or mentioned the biotoxic effect. I think this is something that may be responsible for some of the uh, non-autoimmune, non-infectious component of Lyme disease. And the interesting um, finding is that it's, um, you have to treat it differently. You, you don't treat this with antibiotics. You need to treat it with things that will remove the toxin from the body. So that brings up mold. <clears throat> and mold is another biotoxin in our environment. Mold basically from water damaged buildings. And in the United States, probably 50% of our buildings are water damaged. And there's lots of hidden mold. Here are the mold symptoms that people see. Again, very similar to pandas, very similar to Lyme disease. Cognitive issues. So many people have this. And when they do MRIs, they find these funny things that they call UBOs. We think in the Lyme community, in the mold community, that this gliosis is not just a benign thing. We think it probably is related to the infection. They can see evidence of this on spec scans and on MR spectroscopy. Now there's a new test out, which is an MRI basically of the brain. It's called NeuroQuant. And it has to be done in a special facility. Unfortunately, we don't have any yet in New Hampshire. But it's only a $100 add-on to the regular MRI cost. This is brand new in Lyme. There's a paper that has been written about it for mold disease. And I think it might be useful in helping people distinguish between the mold biotoxin and the Lyme biotoxin. So there's, there's big hope that this will be coming out. So here's a brief treatment message. Look for ex environmental exposures. Try and find the baseline. So it's, you know, it's sort of, it's not a switch like pandas where one day they're normal and one day they're not. This may develop gradually. They may start doing worse at school and, you know, all of a sudden you have a kid who's been pretty bright and over the next year just doesn't seem to be the same. And they miss some days at school and the school nurses will call the parents or the teachers will say, well, 
you know, Jane just wasn't herself this year. We don't know what's going on. And then gradually some of the other information will come out. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these uh, organisms can form biofilms. This is the cis form that I was talking about. We have to watch for that. We have to treat the inflammatory pathology. Um, and then we have to realize that, a, that these injuries can be overcome. But you have to start with the infectious component. Some of these slides didn't come through. OK, so here is a, um, a very important, I think, new uh, test that's available, which is, which is the um, Cunningham panel. It's now commercially available. It used to be that we have to enroll kids in the study, uh, and it took you know, a while to get that done. Um, now there's a, there's a commercial lab that will actually um, uh, do the, the testing. So that's really good. So fine, sort of my summary is I think there's a lot of um, need for more work. I think you do not be put off by somebody telling you that your kid does not have Lyme. If they do a simple test in the hospital and they use the CDC criteria, it really has a very high false negative rate. It shouldn't be a diagnostic screening test. There are labs, other labs in the US that do good screening tests, and um, these are available. I think you have to realize that a lot of infectious diseases might be implicated in PANS and PANDAS, and I think we're just beginning to get some research done. So I'm going to click on this little thing because uh, this is kind of a, a good video. If you, haven't, if you know about molecular, Moleculera, tell me because we can easily, uh, I've got to remember which one it's in here. Yeah, which is on the desktop. Okay, so how did I get back to the desktop? Is that it? Oh, wait, you may have had it. Should I do escape? What's escape to get back to the desktop? Double click on it, mm -hmm. it should go full screen. Or okay. th that one on the screen, yeah, on the screen fills, it should. There we go. All right. Perfect. This educational video is brought to you by Molecular Labs. Our desire is to help you learn more about a treatable autoimmune neurologic condition called PANDAS or PANS. Jimmy. He is a happy, healthy boy who studies hard, makes good grades, and stays active. However, like all children, sometimes during his everyday activity, Jimmy is exposed to germs that can cause infections which lead to becoming sick and ill. These germs may include bacteria such as streptococci, Borrelia and Lyme disease, mycoplasma, and various types of fungus. A whole host of other germs may include viruses, <coughs> such as Coxsackie, influenza, or herpes viruses, and even parasites. During an infection, germs invade our body where they lodge, grow, and multiply in a variety of places. Being exposed to germs is simply a normal part of our everyday life, and our body is prepared to deal with these situations. immune system responds to infections by recruiting the help of protective cells, such as T-cells, B-cells, and macrophages, and evolve the help of other immune system molecules called cytokines. Our immune system is really a surveillance system that continually monitors what is us and what is believed to be a foreign invader. It constantly searches out and recognizes germs that would otherwise be harmful or destructive to us. When B cells and plasma cells find a particular germ, they manufacture antibodies that are tailored to recognize this foreign invader. 
Later, these antibodies will find and help destroy these same germs located in other parts of the body. As long as the infection is present and recognized by the body as being foreign, the fight ensues and antibody production continues. Antibodies travel in the bloodstream, seeking the germs they were directed against. Unfortunately, in some children, these antibodies not only attack the original target, but they also mistakenly target a child's normal proteins. These are called autoimmune antibodies. Sometimes these autoimmune antibodies may even attack normal proteins located within our brain. These antibodies continue to travel to other locations, binding to and attacking other closely related targets. A child's world is turned upside down by this infection-triggered autoimmune condition that interferes with their normal neurologic activity. This misdirected antibody attack can be aimed against dopamine receptors, lysoganglioside, tubulin, and other neurologic targets. Antibody binding can interfere with or even cause overstimulation of neurologic activity within the brain. In pandas and pens, there is a sudden onset of symptoms, such as OCD, motor or vocal tics, and a host of other neuropsychiatric problems. Symptoms may include phobias, anxiety, anorexia, inability to concentrate, sleep disturbances, urinary problems, and even bouts of rage that wax and wane in severity. These are traumatic to the child and their entire family. Pandas and pens can be puzzling to diagnose. This may sometimes lead to treatment of only the symptoms with psychiatric drugs, when the underlying basis is an infection-triggered autoimmune disorder attacking the brain. With proper treatment targeted to the infection and the underlying immune system, pandas and pants children respond differently from those treated with neuropsychiatric drugs alone. If this condition is correctly identified and treated, children often experience significant resolution to their symptoms. The first step in bringing light to this situation is finding a physician who understands this condition. Molecular aids the physician by identifying these autoimmune antibodies using the Cunningham panel of tests. The process is simple. A physician requests testing for their patient online and receives their results through a secure internet portal. There is still much research to be done and much we do not understand about pandas and pans. However, proper diagnosis and treatment of the infection and the immune system can result in suppressing or eliminating these autoimmune antibodies and greatly resolving these symptoms. When autoimmune-based neuropsychiatric and movement disorders such as pandas and pans are properly recognized, diagnosed, and treated, light can shine again for Jimmy and he and his family's world can be restored. This educational video was brought to you by Molecular Labs because we know that there is hope for a brighter future. For more information, ask your doctor for help or contact us at Molecular Labs. So I don't have too much more to say. I do want to just um, <clears throat> mention that it's, um, that it's a complicated, Lyme is a complicated disease, and I don't want to make light of the um, um, confusion between the diagnostic strategies. I just think one of the most important things to note is that if you suspect or you're worried or you know somebody who's worried that their family member may have Lyme disease, to stretch a little bit and go beyond the standard testing because I really don't think it's adequate. Um, <clears throat> and then also to be aware of the autoimmune component and the biotoxic component. And we'll probably get other things coming out in the future. But thank you all very much.